Ilya graduated with honors from the Department of Physics, Moscow State University, Russia. Uh, she received her PhD in space physics from the University of Alberta in Canada. Her research interests include the dynamics of energetic particles in the Earth's radiation belts and ring current, also mechanisms for particle acceleration and loss in the magnetosphere, in a magnetosphere coupling and wave particle interactions. Currently, she's a research scientist at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and the Space Physics, University of Colorado at Boulder. Today, she will talk about emic waves. Uh, before she begins, I would like to remind you that this presentation is recorded as always, so please keep your mics muted. If you have questions, you can send them in the chat directly to myself or in the public chat, and I will try to ask it at the end. Uh, Dr. Maria, thank you for accepting our invitation. Please go ahead when you're ready. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me uh, to talk today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and see uh, uh, a lot of people attending. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen and um, all right. Yeah, so um, Today I'm going to talk about amic waves and uh, particle dynamics in the Earth magnetosphere. And all right, got it. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. Uh, first, uh, it will be more like a um, tutorial style talk. I will talk about solar terrestrial environment. Earth radiation belts, uh, observational platforms that uh, we can use for these studies, uh, wave particle interactions uh, in their role in, in the radiation belt dynamics and overall dynamics of the Earth magnetosphere plasma. So, <clears throat> the role of uh, amic waves, what those are, what they do. Um, I will also talk about uh, energetic particle precipitation and uh, radiation belt modeling. So um, in a nutshell, um, just to summarize all my presentation in one slide, um, the uh, sun constantly emits uh, radiation called the solar wind. Uh, most of the time, the Earth magnetic field deflects it. However, periodically, energetic particles coming from the sun uh, get trapped and energized by Earth magnetic field and form the outer radiation belt. So this is shown in the uh, on the side and on the left hand side is a reconstruction of the uh, inner and outer radiation belt um, that consists of uh, what we know MAB uh, or kilo electrons because they kill satellite instrumentation. So uh, if we uh, talk about geomagnetic storms that sun sets to our planet, there is a bunch of effects that we can potentially be interested in. And I stole this schematic from ESA. It shows uh, all possible effects of uh, geomagnetic storms um, in near Earth space. Um, and um, starting from, from the ground where we can have uh, induced geomagnetic fields and currents um, that can uh, be harmful for um, power line systems. Uh, we can have GPS signal disruptions. We can also see aurora, uh, the atmospheric altitudes. Um, uh, geomagnetic storms also known to uh, introduce high frequency radio wave disturbances as the wave propagate uh, in the ionosphere. They can be uh, dangerous to crew and, and passengers and also astronauts working in orbit. And of course, they can damage satellites. But what we're interested in um, in this chain of events is um, this part, um, energetic radiation ball particles. And this is what I will be talking about today, specifically in the next couple of slides. So um, just to remind you a little bit of history, uh, the Earth radiation belts were discovered unexpectedly with the launch of uh, first American satellite uh, in 1958, 
And uh, here's the crew on the right that is the team that discovered it, Pickering, Van Allen, and Van Brown. <clears throat> uh, um, and uh, what they found that uh, the Earth uh, radiation belt consists of trapped electrons and protons. Um, the outer radiation belt um, is what we study and we've been studying for 60, um, more, more than 60 years. And it's still a mystery. And here is the, uh, the photograph from, uh, from celebration of the uh, 60th anniversary of um, uh, Explorer launch uh, at LASP. And uh, the three of us. Um, so um, the, um, there was a, set, uh, a designated satellite mission um, launched by NASA in 2012 called Van Allen probes um, and or uh, RBSP. So it was, uh, it consists of um, two identical spacecraft on highly elliptical orbit with orbital period about nine hours. Uh, the nominal duration of this mission was two years, but it existed from 2012 all, all the way to 2019. And we got a lot of data from this space, uh, for the, from this mission. Um, that uh, that we keep on analyzing and is being a great source of um, information for us. So it, it consists of um, the, uh, the satellite carry uh, a lot of instrument uh, on board. Um, so we use data from ECT, energetic particle composition and thermoplasma instrument. Uh, then we looked at waves uh, from uh, emphasis instrument. Uh, we looked at both electric and magnetic field components. There is uh, electric field and wave uh, instrument, EFW. Uh, there is radiation belt storm probes, ion composition experiment. They can, um, uh, where we can look at uh, different um, ion species from this instrument, and also a relativistic proton spectrometer. Um, that uh, that was designed to study the inner radiation belt. So, in addition to um, to spacecraft um, uh, data on um, in space, uh, well, Van Allen probes, we can look at um, ground-based data. So, we can analyze disturbances coming from space uh, from ground-based magnetometers, and here's a Here's a figure showing uh, Canadian sector and Canadian uh, magnetometer array Charisma, a bunch of magnetometers here on the ground. We can also um, utilize um, um, data from uh, stratospheric balloons at stratospheric altitude. So here I'm showing the, the barrel campaign. Uh, that was, uh, there were several campaigns uh, during the Van Allen probes era. Um, that can monitor uh, effects of energetic particle precipitation at atmospheric um, altitudes. And there is also uh, uh, CubeSat satellites at, at LEO and uh, NOAA satellites um, that, um, that we can use for tracking particles precipitating into the atmosphere, um, going down to the atmosphere. So um, just to... Uh, start briefly uh, what um, uh, what the radiation belts are and what kind of particle population we have in the, um, in the magnetosphere, I will introduce you this slide. So this is um, reconstruction of uh, satellite data. It shows the, um, uh, the inner radiation belt, uh, the outer radiation belt, and also the ring current population. So the um, um, outer radiation belt, as I mentioned before, consists of uh, relativistic uh, electrons with uh, roughly 0.1 to 10 MeV energies. Uh, ring current uh, is generated by ions uh, drifting around Earth um, and mostly consists of uh, protons, helium, and oxygen ions that uh, the fluxes of which um, greatly enhanced during uh, during magnetic storms. So uh, before I showed you a picture consisting of only two radiation belts, the reality is more complex. Uh, in fact, uh, the one of the first 
major discoveries from the Van Allen probes mission is that the outer radiation belt can uh, exhibit a two belt structure that uh, is energy dependent. So we can um, have an outer, an additional belt at uh, multi MeV energies. And uh, the formation of these structures is still kind of an open question. There are several proposed mechanisms why, uh, why the outer radiation belt can split uh, into two. Uh, one of the proposed mechanisms is uh, MIC waves. Um, and um, the next slide here shows the another um, important population in the inner magnetosphere called the plasma sphere that is a region of um, cold and dense, what we call dense is thousand particles per cubic centimeter uh, plasma of ionospheric origin that mostly corrotates with the earth. And it extends all the way up to the distances from three to six earth radii, depending on the geomagnetic conditions. Uh, quite often it has a, lo a lot of uh, azimuthal uh, structure, so it's not uniformly distributed around the earth. And this is a reconstruction of the image satellite data. And on the right hand side, I'm showing the overlap between the cold population and the, uh, the hot population, the radiation belt, uh, that gives rise to a lot of different uh, interesting phenomena that we study here. So uh, overall, the balance uh, between energization and loss defines the total flux of electrons that we can uh, see in, in the, in the in around, around the Earth. So there are two processes that um, uh, and um, the, um, the losses um, that, uh, well, uh, we can observe, they can be external and internal. So external losses are um, mainly due to two processes, magnetic pulse shadowing and outward radial diffusion. So during which the particles that are normally drifting around Earth end up on a few lines that connect to interplanetary magnetic, um, magnetic fields and um, leave the system from the outer boundary, uh, the magnetopause over here. The second uh, process is when the particles um, um, end up in the atmosphere and um, there are three different processes that may cause that. So there is charge exchange with uh, neutral atoms, Coulomb collisions, and wave particle interactions over here. So why do we need wave particle interactions? Uh, so first, uh, when uh, if we look at the evolution of DST index, uh, the storm time index, from ground-based magnetometers that uh, gives us the intensity of ring current and um, particles build up around um, uh, around Earth. Uh, we can see that um, um, the signature of um, and the the storm phase time uh, can vary. And uh, what we see here is the main storm phase uh, when DST drops significantly and then recovers. So to explain fast recovery of uh, DST index we need to um, um, use uh, wave particle interaction information about them. Another, um, another um, kind of topic here is a, a relativistic electron flux variability during different storms that have been shown to sometimes increase um, uh, the flux, overall or flux increase, decrease, or experience little change in all this um, all these um, processes can happen uh, when these particles interact with plasma waves uh, in the magnetosphere. And I'll be talking about that more in, uh, in a few slides. So uh, also the, the flux um, of energetic particles, uh, the electrons uh, has a lot of um, variability uh, as a function of energy. So, this is a, a year of measurements from 2012 to 2013 on Van Allen probes. And it shows uh, the flux in two energy channels, 0.9 MeV and 3.6 MeV or more 
energetic channel as a function of radial distance or L star um, and, um, and time. And you can see that um, depending on uh, the energy, uh, there is a lot of variability, but it's not, uh, it's not kind of the same evolution of this, this two. And uh, to explain this, we also need um, interactions with um, um, different plasma waves. So um, periodic charge particle motion. This is what particles do um, when they uh, when they um, um, continue their motion uh, in Earth magnetic field. So there are three types of motion associated with cyclotron motion. Uh, that is the fastest type of motion. And here electrons and ions gyrate in opposite directions around magnetic field because ions are um, heavier. Their gyro frequency typically lie for a proton uh, in the frequency range about one to two hertz, while el electrons are about 2000 times faster. The second type of motion is uh, bounce motion. Um, so particles go uh, from northern to southern hemisphere and bounce um, um, uh, along magnetic field line. So here we have um, an L shell. So this is a distance from the center of the Earth uh, to, the, uh, to the field line in the equatorial plane. And alpha, the pitch angle, is, a, um, is, an, is an ang the angle between the particle velocity um, and the direction of the background magnetic field. So if alpha is equal to zero, particle goes straight uh, along magnetic field line and um, escape in the atmosphere. If uh, alpha is 90, you will continue gyration around magnetic field line in the equatorial plane. And most of the particles are kind of trapped and uh, um, continue the motion in between here. So the third uh, motion type is uh, drift motion. And in this case, electrons and ions drift in the opposite direction. And this is what creates the ring current. And this is the slowest type of motion for electrons. Uh, it's about millihertz range. So this is the cartoon uh, that shows um, all of these three types of motion uh, in progress. And if there were no disturbances and no magnetic, um, uh, and no plasma waves, this uh, motion would have continued forever. But because we have plasma disturbances, uh, it doesn't always happen like this. And here I'm showing the characteristic time scales for protons and electrons as a function of kinetic energy uh, and radial distance self. Uh, uh, from Earth. And it can uh, give you an idea of what kind of resonances and what time scales you can have with different, uh, with, um, different waves um, as a function of particle energy and, and radial distance. So uh, wave particle interactions are associated with violation of adiabatic invariance that disrupt the motion that I showed you in the slide before. And um, this is a good kind of reference table to look at uh, the characteristic time scales. So um, the, um, we normally, when we look at uh, radiation ball dynamics, we are interested in three types of waves. Uh, the ultra low frequency waves, ULF waves are the uh, slowest and the largest waves in the system. Um, they typically have frequencies in the range of millihertz to few hertz. And there are three different processes that may drive them uh, in different uh, areas or regions of magnetosphere. Uh, they can be created by solar wind impulses on the day side, uh, plasma disturbances and instabilities coming from the tail, and they can be also generated in flanks of the uh, magnetosphere, similar to uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instability in the atmosphere that I, I'm showing here. So emic waves are uh, traditionally uh, uh, classified as ULF waves based on their frequency, but they are generated on the microscopic scale and not uh, macroscopic scale as uh, typically ULF waves. And uh, that's why we kind of like put them in a separate category. 
The a second type of wave motion is uh, wave types uh, is uh, Whistler mode waves, and those are chorus and hiss. These are electromagnetic plasma waves um, in the frequency range for chorus uh, close to electron gyro frequency waves. So um, this is a typical uh, chorus wave measurements from um, Crest satellite, and uh, this is one orbit that shows all, all sorts of uh, wave activity uh, here. So Crest um, um, can measure, could measure um, waves uh, at very high frequency frequencies over here. So um, this is Whistler mode chorus waves, and we're also interested in the plasma sphere kiss waves that are generated inside the uh, inside the plasma sphere. And uh, one of the possible sources of his generation is, is chorus, though it's still uh, a work in progress, I think. Uh, um, so uh, pretty much what we need to know that these waves uh, can uh, be important for um, electron dynamics in them, uh, in the radiation belts. And they observed at slightly different frequencies and they're much, um, lower amplitude waves compared to your, your left waves. So uh, that would be an order of 10 uh, picotesla versus um, 10 hundred, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, nanotesla. So uh, for AMIC waves, uh, this is the, the last type of uh, wave uh, modes that I will talk about here. This is just the focus of my talk today. These are uh, transverse plasma waves generated by ion cyclotron instability. The energy source for these uh, waves is provided by green current ions or plasma sheet ions uh, with temperature and isotropy. The typical, typical amplitude in space are order of one nanotesla in B and one millivolt per meter in E. And typical frequencies uh, lie in the PC1 range uh, from 0.1 to 5 Hertz. Though you can see much um, higher frequencies if you go, uh, uh, if you observe them uh, deeper in the inner magnetosphere because the magnetic field increases and the, um, uh, the frequencies of the waves also um, increase. So they can typically generate it in three bands, uh, helium uh, band, uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And here I'm showing a spectrogram from GOES that shows these two types of bands. So this is the, the hydrogen band generated uh, under the hydrogen gyro frequency. It's not shown here. Um, this is the helium band uh, under the helium gyro frequency. And the oxygen band can also be observed sometimes, though there is a lot of uh, other wave activity in this, um, in this frequency band, ULF waves. Um, generated here. So it's harder to observe because it can be mixed with other um, types of waves. So recently, um, they have, uh, there were indications there are also other um, bands are important uh, in the inner magnetosphere. So Mark and Gabretson presented observations of helium plus plus waves. So you will have an, inter um, an additional uh, step band over here uh, due to helium plus plus. And uh, these waves were previously observed in the plasma sheet uh, on other satellite missions, but not in the inner magnetosphere. And also nitrogen bands um, can, can also be important. So um, it's pretty close to uh, oxygen uh, due to its mass. So it's also hard to observe this, this two type of waves there. So uh, cyclotron wave generation, uh, this, is, uh, this schematic shows how this wave instability um, actually generates waves. So if you have an isotropic distribution with uh, respect to the background magnetic field, so this would be the parallel direction and that will be the perpendicular direction. If, if it's not entirely symmetric, uh, nature doesn't love uh, asymmetry. So we'll try to kind of make this asymmetric distribution symmetric and the excess of perpendicular energy will be released in the form of waves. So when this um, 
when these waves form, their uh, polarization depends on uh, on the particle species that create this instability. So if it's uh, left, uh, if it's um, ions, the wave polarization would be the same as ion polarization uh, sense of rotation around magnetic field. It will be left-handed. If it's electrons, it will be right-handed. And also, um, the, once, once the wave has generated, uh, it can exchange uh, energy with thermal uh, particles, um, and it can uh, um, heat um, uh, different ion species. For example, uh, EMIC waves are known to uh, transfer the energy to helium plus ions. That was a re uh, very interesting observation recently by Kitamura et al. Uh, using uh, high frequency MMS measurements, high cadence measurements. So for EMIC waves, uh, typically what we're interested in in relation to um, radiation ball dynamics is the cyclotron resonance. So uh, it happens when the wave uh, frequency um, matches, um, uh, matches the pi particle cyclotron frequency. So this is the general formula. Uh, typically, the n uh, equals one resonance, uh, more important, uh, though you can also have high order resonances. So cyclotron resonance does not uh, change particle energy and only uh, results in scattering or momentum exchange uh, without energy coupling. So the, uh, if we substitute n in this, uh, n equals zero in this formula, we'll, uh, we'll have Landau resonance. That is um, uh, most important for um, oblique uh, EMIC waves, where you uh, have a parallel components of uh, electric field. So Landau resonance um, interactions lead to typically wave attenuation and energy transfer from EMIC wave to uh, uh, thermal electrons in um, EV to tensile EV um, energy range and KV ions. And also found recently to contribute to scattering of relativistic electrons. And this is what I'm showing here. So this is the kind of the cyclotron resonance. Also um, bounce resonance interactions with energetic electrons were found to produce particle scattering. And this resonance takes place when electron bounce period you know, matches matches the wave period. So uh, for EMIC waves or like waves in general, uh, plasma waves, one of the important characteristics is a wave uh, dispersion relation, relation between uh, wave uh, frequency and um, k vector. And uh, this uh, diagram shows three different modes that can be generated here. Uh, in plasma that consists of he uh, hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. Um, and the right-hand side shows the resonance, uh, minimum resonance energy with electrons for these three, three, uh, th three modes. And for left-hand uh, propagating waves uh, in different plasma densities, you will see that generally the resonance energy uh, lowers uh, in, in the regions of high plasma density. And most of the time uh, at low uh, plasma density, uh, it lies in pretty uh, high energy range, about several, several or tenths um, MAV range. So uh, this is just a very interesting study that I personally like a lot that shows that EMIC waves can cause uh, precipitation of uh, protons, uh, what we expect from theory, uh, in the form of proton aurora. Uh, and it, uh, at the same time, it can cause electron precip precipitation. So these are ground-based observations from Canadian sector, uh, from Athabasca station uh, that has uh, all sky um, camera. And uh, here you can clearly see a proton arc uh, in this kind of like um, bluish uh, um, wavelengths. Um, and at the same time, um, you can see uh, EMIC waves measured by a ground-based magnetometer. So what was interesting about this study 
is that uh, once this uh, waves and protein aurora was observed in the ground, NOAA spacecraft uh, uh, was at the location conjugate to the field line that supported the source of wave activity and saw precipitation of particles at low Earth orbit over here. And that was a satellite track over here. So, uh, and these are the measurements from both uh, different energy channels, um, um, ions and electrons. And we clearly see enhanced in um, channel that goes um, along the ma uh, magnetic field line in both proton and um, electron, electron channel. So overall, to summarize the role of AMIC waves and energy coupling in the magnetosphere, um, I'm showing here this uh, schematic. So what it shows that ring current protons uh, generate AMIC waves, uh, that this process would cause loss uh, of protons, uh, but these energies create waves. Uh, waves in turn dissipate uh, due to Landau damping and will um, transfer the air energy uh, to uh, plasmaspheric electrons and ions. This will be heated in, uh, <clears throat> and finally, uh, they can interact with uh, relativistic electrons and uh, cause loss of these electrons too. So recently there has been kind of like a, uh, um, um, a renewed interest towards uh, processes that happen in, um, in cold pl uh, plasmaspheric population. And the MIC wave uh, kind of got renewed interest uh, from, uh, from the community that, that is working in cold plasma, um, cold plasma observations as well, due to the potential effect of um, heating of this uh, population. So um, finally, um, what I'm um, here, um, what I'm showing here is a schematic uh, that uh, demonstrates where the different plasma waves are generated. And these plasma waves are included in um, simulations and global, global modeling of radiation, radiation belts. So these are his waves that I talked about before uh, inside the plasma sphere, coarse waves, more on the dawn side. And um, um, EMIC waves that were originally believed to be generated along the dusk side plasma pause where they could um, uh, also interact with uh, radiation belt electrons as so though drift around the earth. And uh, this uh, region uh, was found to be important from the original, from the early studies uh, for radiation belt um, precipitation and loss. Uh, if we um, look at uh, satellite data measurements and uh, look at the wave distribution from real um, and occurrences rate from real uh, measurements based on multiple satellite missions, we will see that EMIC waves actually pretty typical um, in different AMLT local time sectors and they can be created uh, along um, dusks, uh, actually um, midnight to dawn sector, that, that would be kind of the most prevalent location of those waves. And actually on the, on the, um, on the night side as well, though not very common. Uh, and this kind of um, um, figure uh, makes us wonder where these interactions may be important, uh, may, may not necessarily be the dust site plasma pause that we assumed was important before. So we definitely wanna know uh, where and when uh, these interactions may take place. And also for MIC waves, because they are more complex than say chorus his, uh, different bands can have their own uh, distribution and uh, helium band wave distribution may be different from hydrogen band. So we, we wanna know what it looks like depending on the, um, function of geomagnetic uh, activity and solar wind uh, drivers. And also we want to know uh, what is there, um, what is the kind of the, um, uh, the inner boundary of this um, potential interaction. 
So the outer boundary is uh, magnetopause. So there are a lot of waves uh, <clears throat> generated here. Uh, and um, uh, this region magnetopause is known to kind of con confine the wave activity on the, uh, on the day side of the ma magnetosphere. Um, and uh, as for, uh, for the um, inner boundary, we're still working on it and we're kind of looking at uh, Van Allen probes data just to see where the boundary is and how these waves are distributed. Uh, so just to illustrate that uh, three uh, band waves, so here's the uh, hydrogen, helium, and oxygen can be distributed differently. And this is the uh, data based on uh, Saikin et al. Uh, 2015 paper looking at just uh, uh, a region uh, initially uh, from data uh, from the satellite from Van Allen probes launch uh, all the way through July, uh, June uh, 30th, 2014. And this is more extended uh, data analysis from Channel uh, 2019, uh, showing data from September 2012 through uh, 31st of December 2018. And here they show that uh, uh, hydrogen and helium and oxygen band waves uh, do have different occurrences rate and, and different distribution uh, as a function of local time. Also interested in the inner boundary, uh, we uh, looked at um, uh, Van Allen Pro's measurements for that, um, and we looked through the entire mission. So here's the data uh, showing example of wave observations during a pretty big magnetic storm in June 2015. So DST was minus 204. And uh, where we saw AMIC waves on both uh, probes A and B uh, deep in the, uh, in the magnetosphere. So as low as L uh, equal 1.7. And here I'm showing simulation from um, uh, Jerry uh, Goldstein. So showing that these waves uh, uh, were generated at the plasma sphere boundary, the plasma pause. And that was also consistent with uh, spacecraft um, plasma density measurements. So we could see them actually in both probes and both saw them as the satellite crossed the plasma pause location, which was pretty interesting. This event was also pretty extended. So the, um, um, the, the range of L shell that uh, supported the wave activity was 1.5 in this case, pretty wide. So we also looked at more storms and more events like this. We found that the slow L shell events um, generated only during magnetic storms, uh, not necessarily very big storms, uh, but we saw several events um, um, as low as um, 1.7. Most of those uh, low L shell L events uh, were generated between L 2.2 and 2.3. And there was also uh, quite a few at L2.5. So a lot of them were observed in 2015, um, almost like a half of them, due to a combination of large number of storms and satellite orbit mostly on the day side. So here's the overall distribution of these events. So to include this further into global modeling, uh, what we can do is we can uh, solve a diffusion equation. Uh, for example, um, um, using um, verb, verb code or Salamba or Bass and Dream. Uh, um, so the, all these codes are based on um, the Fokker Planck equation. So it can uh, simulate evolution of uh, electron distribution function or phase space density. And with empirical diffusion coefficients uh, that are derived from statistical models. So uh, here's what this equation looked like. And this um, um, diffusion coefficients tell us where, uh, where the particle density, space space density will move in radiant, uh, radial distance, pitch angle, or energy. Um, so um, where these models can be used. So they can be used to, uh, to look at uh, sources versus losses uh, 
they can be used to model radial acceleration um, of electrons. They can be uh, used to model local acceleration, for example, by, by coarse waves. Um, and they can be also used to look at uh, loss of uh, energetic particles and to look at the you know, processes like uh, um, gradual loss, sudden loss um, at the magnetic loss, um, and localized losses, uh, for example, uh, due to MSC waves. And uh, this is the study that, um, that was done by Alexander Drozdov um, at UCLA. Uh, and we looked at, um, um, we looked at the evolution of um, uh, radiation belt fluxes, uh, specifically in this 4.2 MeV energy range, because this is um, believed to be in, uh, the energy range that would uh, easily uh, interact with MSC waves. And <clears throat> these are the observations from the Allen probes uh, for a year between October 2012 and October 2013 in the same format that I showed before, radial distance on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And uh, these are their observations. And these are all these panels are simulation results. So again, as, as I mentioned before, Alexander solved uh, the Planck, uh, Planck equation and look at the evolution of electron flux. And we use uh, statistical wave maps and uh, parameterizations to uh, study the effect of different uh, plasma wave modes. So here uh, uh, he looked at ULF, uh, then ORS and HIS and EMIC waves. Um, and uh, the goal was uh, to parameterize unique wave occurrence depending on the following parameters geomagnetic wave activity indices and to look at the evolution of the flux uh, and to compare it uh, with um, uh, Van Allen probes data. So here you see simulations with no unique waves, uh, his waves and, uh, and force waves. So this is just mostly the radial diffusion uh, caused by ULF waves and a little bit of scattering caused by his. So this is simulation with MIC waves, but no his and no force, so this will be on the ULF waves. You will see that um, mostly it results in a lot of acceleration and no, no losses. So if we go further and um, include um, EMIC waves, uh, but no his, uh, but, but force waves, we'll see a lot better comparison between data and simulations. And finally, these two panels show simulation with EMIC, his, and no cores, and EMIC, his, and cores. So you will see once you add more level of complexity um, and by switching on in all different wave modes, you can get a better approximation of the fluxes measured on the satellite uh, and a much, much more better, uh, well, um, Kind of agreement uh, between between model and data. So of course it's not ideal. There are still uh, some uh, some processes that need to be taken into into account. For example, there was a, um, a an interval of local acceleration here at the very beginning of the interval that is not really captured well by the model, and um, some of the loss processes are not very well included either. But um, this, as I said before, um, a pretty high level of complexity um, that, uh, that actually shows that all uh, wave, plasma wave modes are important, including MIC waves, uh, to reproduce uh, the, the data. So uh, pretty much I think I'm kind of like running out of time. And this is the summary of my talk. Um, Magnetospheric plasma dynamics is affected by interaction with different wave modes. So we looked at uh, these wave modes in this talk. Emic waves act as a, an intermediary that couples energy and momentum between different energy magnetospheric plasma populations uh, through different resonances. Uh, 
to properly include MIC waves uh, into global models, we need to know where and uh, under uh, what con conditions they're generated. Uh, and uh, their wave properties statistically have been studied extensively using Van Allen probes um, data. And radiation ball simulations have shown the importance of MIC waves in ultra relativistic electron dynamics. And I'm thinking the next step might be to look at the effect of uh, MIC wave, for example, on uh, plasma heating uh, with uh, new would launch um, of new satellite missions that would study, for example, this population specifically. And uh, we can also look at the effects of uh, um, precipitating particles also on ionosphere and atmosphere. So um, there is a lot that can be done in relation to energy coupling and processes in the inner magnetosphere for different plasma populations. So I guess this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much. And I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Maria. That was wonderful, very clear and informative talk. Uh, before we go to questions, and I would like to give people a chance to type their, in, their last minute questions if they have any. Uh, I want to remind everybody that next week we do not have a talk. It's a holiday. So enjoy your holiday and please join us again in two, two weeks time on 13 of September uh, when we have Lauren Blum talking about the particle precipitations. So uh, let's go to questions. I have one question here from Eric and he wants to know what geophysical conditions favor which emic bands, if you know anything about this. Oh, well, thank you for your question, Eric. So uh, what we know uh, from, uh, again, uh, statistical studies that uh, for hydrogen band, uh, statistically, it seems that compressions on the day side are more important. For helium band, it seems like it's uh, injections coming from the tail that are more important. Uh, but I, uh, we can also observe AM, AMIC waves during magnet magnetosphere compressions in two, in two bands. So you may have also helium band generated uh, during compressions, for example, and hydrogen band ge generated during injections. So this is just still like a relative importance of two processes. Did I answer your question? Thank you. I think you did. Uh, I hope he's happy with the question and the answer. Uh, yes, so I also have a question. Uh, you showed a very nice diagram of the map of the waves that you've uh, drawn from the statistical data around slide 26, I guess. Over here. Uh, 25, yeah, that's the one, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's great to see uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of map from the actual data, statistical data. Can you tell me more about the data they've used? Is this just from Van Allen data or you've used other satellites? No, well, uh, you know, the, the studies that address this question uh, have been, uh, well, uh, it's like on, ongoing uh, since, uh, since the 90s. So this, in, uh, this is based on CREST satellite data, uh, Themis cluster and Van Allen probes data. But here's pretty much like all, all the wave modes uh, together. So if you split this into separate bands, you might see different, uh, slightly different picture. So this does not reflect the fact, for example, that hydrogen may be more on the day side while helium may be more kind of like during injections on the, on the dust side. This is everything um, together. Okay, that's good. When, when should we look forward to this paper being submitted or published? Maybe. Well, hopefully pretty soon. Okay. Because I like that diagram. I would like to use it. Oh, well, you can, <laughs> you can steal it from me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so apart from that, I think we have um, praises for your talk from different people. So thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, and let's see everybody in two weeks' time. Thank you for accepting well, our invitation. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Maria. Great talk.
Thanks. <laughs>